Big line, Michael will be first down. Michael Martyr saying that Joe McKeon is his favorite player. As he wrote on his bio, now he has his ace nine of spades under the gun. I think a lot of these players had fun with their bios, making them out late last night. Yeah, Joe's bio is definitely very friendly with uh, each other. <laughs> Funny stuff in there. There are lots of trolls. However, I don't think that that one's a troll. I think that Michael Martyr has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, respect for Joe's game. Here we have uh, Justin. Joe has certainly earned it. Justin Zaki in the big blind is going to defend the suited Jack Deuce. Is is that a mandatory defend here in the big blind? Depends on how the open raise is sized. I think against a two and a half X, you can fold it. Against a smaller raise, I would say it is a defend, yeah. I think a lot of players, you know, may think that they have the ability to navigate post flop a little better too. Um, now, does this uh, does the fact that you're at the final table there are ICM implications? Does that make you more likely to to fold this hand in the big blind? You should be playing. Yeah, definitely. A it's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be harder to reach a river with uh, your weak one pair of hands. You're gonna there people are gonna put more pressure on you. They're gonna make you fold, and then you know, there are gonna be some awkward spots where you like over flush and stuff. But you're just an ICM faster. For you. So you definitely have to tighten up your. Now, Michael two barreling here is going to put Justin in a really tough spot. He's going to wind up going. I think he actually there. checked he, he back. Yeah, the he, flop he checked. Here. He checked back the flop with the nut flush draw uh, pretty quickly, which, uh, was, which was interesting. He turns a gut shot. Justin making the call. That is not an easy call. We're going to the river here. It's a ten of diamonds. A good card for Michael. As Justin, you just want to hand your cards to the dealer here. So here, here, I, I was. Big bet from huge Mike here. bet here. Yeah, I don't, I don't like a huge bet. It doesn't make any sense. You're not going to get action from anything if you bet this size. You might as well bet like an eighth pot or something and hope Justin has a nine or two pair and, and makes a crying call. That's hard for Justin. He's got a nine too here. I think it's this size. If he does have a nine, he'll just fold it. So Michael will take that one down. He had a lot of outs going into the river. I'm a little surprised to see that flop check from him. I ranks, you know? yeah, yeah, it would have been interesting to see that. what Michael had done on a blank river. I want to see some of these guys. I, I would really like to see every one of these players play heads up right now. Like I think it'll be an interesting match regardless of who gets down that far. Because yeah, everybody has such kind of their own unique spin on everything they've done so far. They're all good players, but all in kind of slightly different ways. How long are the blind levels? Because you've been at this level the whole time, right? Uh, I believe the I blinds are, I believe the blinds are 60 minutes. Okay. For the final table, yes. Says, Action on Justin and the small blind. Zach raises up to 250. Uh, Joe doesn't even consider the 8 9 suited on the button either. That's what you would have That one I'm a little surprised by, I think, uh, given how light Zach's been opening. Yeah, I would. I mean, I, I definitely would not mind seeing Joe mix in some, whether it be calls or raises or, okay, you know, yeah, every, I, anything there, really. You didn't even consider it. So. No, those are not. Joe, Joe is the. I don't want to get too into this, but, you know, Joe, that's just not the, the spots that Joe kind of looks for. Um, I think we see Joe play. Joe's Joe's game revolves around I think that Jack Ten hand that you saw. You know he's going to play a heads up pot and he's going to look for a spot where he might be able to find some weakness. Um, he's not the type to go after these a, a chip leader you know like this. Yeah, he's got he's got a really nice controlled game, but he's very capable of stepping out of line when the situation requires it, like you saw in the Jack Ten hand. And Justin with the best hand here. I don't think, yeah, he can't go anywhere on this. No, it's certainly not going anywhere for the first bet. Board. Kind of big sizing from Zach given the, uh, the board texture.
Yeah. River we go. Justin's still in the lead, but Ace Queen. So unless Zach tries to bluff here, Justin is gonna win the hand. So this is similar to the first pot we were talking about, where if I were in Zach's shoes, I may want to just check back the flop here with a6. Do you think that, that, that that's a mistake? you think uh, he should... Uh, Brian, I heard you say that you would have liked to see a larger c-bet. No, I was, I was saying smaller. I think he made it too large. Okay. Uh, I'm actually, I think against the small blind, yeah, checking is a, has a lot more merit there, because Justin did call the small blind flop, right? Right. Yeah, so his range for calling the small blind is much, much narrower than it is in the big blind. You have to proceed with a great deal more caution against the small blind flat than against the big blind flat. Because the big blind is basically calling you with just like all sorts of stuff. The small blind has to worry about a lot more things. He's not going to call you nearly as wide. So, um, yeah, but also, like also you can eliminate, uh, uh, since uh, Justin called out of the small blind, you can eliminate most not a lot of nines from his range that you wouldn't be able to eliminate from the big blind. So if you were planning on multi-barreling, is that a consideration? Yeah, Justin will have less nine x or just like random, you know, good showdown value hands like what he had and like pocket pairs and stuff like that. So, the the upper end of his range is cut off a little bit, but the the bottom end is much stronger than it would be out of the big blind. Right. That raises makes it two hundred fifty thousand. Action on Justin on the button. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of a 2.5 xing as a standard open size here. <laughs> yeah, I think for a deeper stacked final table, that's not uncommon. To see a little bit of larger sizing. I, I definitely think a lot, a lot of the time you'll see smaller sizing, but we're seeing fairly consistent 2.5 from. So here, Jack, uh, Zach checks back the deuce, deuce four. I, I would, this, I would have continuation bet this one. Yeah, I, I like a small c bet here from Zach. The spot where like your king high is gonna be good really often, because the big one's just gonna completely miss so often. So a small c bet will take it down, and then you know if you do get called and you're behind, uh, you, you have the backdoor spade and you have open cards. Good run out here. Is he going to lead? I guess considering it. Does he leads for about the size of the pot? And now Zach with just a bluff catcher here. And most of Eric's uh, obvious bluffs, like, other than spades, kind of got there. Like his straight draws got there. His ace high floats got there. I'd and be Zach very does surprised bluff one of the spades. Zach call here, especially after Eric just pulled that you know bluff against Joe that got caught. It seems, it seems a little tougher to hero call here. Agreed. Yeah, he does make Zach the Zach will make the fold. You hear the Mega clock expiring Zach. after Zach has folded. Eric shows him. So Eric still in, uh, still the short stack at this final table with 30 big blinds. Zach still in the lead with 158 big blinds. Joe McKeon has been increasing his stack up to 91 big blinds. As you can see, the Payouts there. First place, 652,000, 15 of it in equity in a uh, tournament buy in. The Tournament of Champions? It was a great tournament. So that's actually counted in the first place then? Uh, in that 650, yes. First place is okay. uh, 637,000 plus the Tournament of Champions buy in. Gotcha. Yeah, Tournament of Champions seems like a fun one. I would like to play that someday. I hope so. Yeah, same. All you have to do is win a world poker tour. That's it, huh? That easy? 
Is it going to be more fun playing in the Tournament of Champions or, or getting yourself in, in the necessary position to, to be there? <laughs> it's a close one. I think it's a good problem to have either way. Yeah. Eric Limps here. Zach. Jack. Deuce of Spades. Zach is going to put some pressure on Eric's limp here. He does raise to 375,000. I'd be hesitant to apply too much pressure to Eric since he does not seem like the type to back down in these scenarios. Yeah, Zach's hand isn't terrible if he gets limp called. If he gets limp shoved on, of course, that's pretty bad for him because then he has to fold. But even if Eric were to limp call with King-9 offsuit, for example, Zach would be able to apply a lot of pressure. Kind of surprised see Eric fold here. Over wow. Overall advantage yeah. in this spot. So am I. And Zach's raise gets through. Yeah, Zach taking that one down with a little bit of pressure. Zach Whenever somebody limps blind, just blind, their range is necessarily going to be pretty weak. There's just you know, a lot of hands in the deck, and most of them aren't very good. So when you have the big stack the spot that you can certainly apply a lot of pressure in if you so desire. That's certainly true, Brian, especially when uh, in live tournaments you'll see a lot of people don't have a balanced small blind limping range. They'll just go ahead and raise all their uh, strong hands out of the small blind, and then they'll they'll limp a lot of uh, garbage. Right. Zach Aker is seeing his chip lead. Looks like he's over 18 million now. Justin right in the middle of the pack there, about just over 5 million. Over to Eric, Queen 8 offsuit. Now he's limping the button. Put him for the limp with the Queen 8 offsuit. Well, these players are definitely mixing it up at this final table, that's for sure. We've seen a little bit of everything. I like I like the limp with a hand like Ace-2 suited a lot more than Queen-8 offsuit, because, you know, the like we saw the limp earlier with Ace-2 suited. I mean, it didn't work out for him, obviously, because he busted on the hand, but um, I, I like that sort of hand a lot more, because it's going to play better multi-way. Queen-8 offsuit, you know, three ways is not going to be very good most of the time. We'll see Joe take the lead with the four and the backdoor spades. Nobody else has much of anything here. Any merit to Joe leading here from the big blind instead of checking? I don't. I don't believe so. Um, I think it's the kind of situation where, when your opponents continue, they generally have stronger hands than the one that you have. Uh, you could possibly get some value, but I'd rather just uh, induce my opponent to bluff. Like, like Eric here. feels like the type to bet a lot here, too. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if we think Eric's going to be betting most of the time, I think it's a pretty clear check call. If we expect it to get checked through on the flop, then I think leading has more merit. So Joe picks up. River Jack doesn't help either player. We'll see if Eric takes one more shot at it. But after Joe already caught him bluffing, he might be a little bit gun shy now. And Joe will take that one down. And that's part of the problem with limping your button with uh, Queen 8. Uh, Joe likely would have folded the big blind with the Queen 4 offsuit. Maybe. If, yeah, if he two and a half x rays, I think Joe probably folds. Uh, but yeah, we're seeing we're seeing more of Joe's style. It, Kind of small pot where his opponents have a weak range, and he just he just uh, you know bluff catches at the right frequency and makes money in a lot of low variance spots. As you can see here, Joe McKeon is 18th of all time in the United States money list. He's also uh, presently 21st on the Global Poker Index. He has 14.1 million dollars in live tournament earnings. A little bit more than half of that coming from the 2015 World Series of Poker main event, of course. One of the impressive things. That's is very impressive having having yeah. a you know two X main event win as your total. Like most people who've won the main event, the vast majority of their career earnings are just from that. But he's, he still has another main event win worth of earnings outside of that, which is just incredible if you think about it. Yeah, last year he won the 10K limit hold'em. 
championship at the World Series of Poker. His most recent final table, he took fourth place in the 25K high roller at Hollywood Hard Rock earlier this month. Or, I'm sorry, in January. Yeah, he's definitely shown an ability to win at all buy-in levels. Also, very consistent several player, forms impressive. of poker. Yeah, yeah li playing limit as well. And he's, he's, he's had a lot of success here. Uh, generally, more success in the $2,700 main events than the $3,500 main events. Uh, just last year in 2017, he came in third in the April event here. Uh, that was for 138000 And then in July, he came back and took second for 196000 And I was commentating that one, and I've had the, the pleasure of commentating uh, many final tables that Joe has been at. And, uh, it's really remarkable. Uh, the, I'm commentating somewhere he's at the final table. I'm playing in others where he's running deep. It, it, it's it's crazy. He's just always there. He's always in the mix. Yeah, he's just an incredible player. I gotta say, guys, it looks like that limping bug is contagious here. Because we got another. Yeah, limp. it seems like it. We Zach it. limping, Jack. I I don't know about this one. I mean, I think if the big stack, he'd much rather just raise and try to take it down. We got a bit of a ragtag hand here. Yeah, I, I don't understand this limp at all. Well, I tell you, it might work on this board. <laughs> yeah, it might if he if he bets anything, he might. Although you know, Joe with King High not not necessarily going to go away for one bet. Joe is uh, pretty good at sticking around when he needs to. Joe Now Joe is basically beating everything but an ace or a pocket pair here. He might not necessarily fold. But we'll see. Joe makes the call. see if Zach will fall. We do see Joe make the call, so we'll see if Zach manages to fire another bullet on the river and take it down here. Yeah, Zach Joe can definitely play some ace X hands this way. Zach hasn't followed through in a few of the spots so far. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't hear either. Yeah, and the way, the way this final table plays out, like the, trying to pull Joe seems like a really bad idea, just generally speaking, so. All he's been doing is just bluff catching everybody and winning. Sometimes that's all it takes. Makes the right reads, puts the chips in, and let your opponent kind of do the rest. And that looks like Joe's strategy here. It's working out so well. Definitely working out so far. You don't have to try to do too much. Looks like Joe is up to... Uh, let's call it almost nine million, eight and a half. I want to say, based on my eyeball count here. Very nicely played. Final yeah, it's actually like it's a closer to nine. Yeah. And after the elimination of Steven, Joe is the youngest remaining player at this final table. Which think about that for a moment. All the earnings we just discussed, all of his final tables, all of his wins, and he's. Still the youngest of this crew of mostly young players. Only 26 years old, and, and I mean, uh, there's a chance that, you know, Joe at the age of 26 years old with already over 14 million in tournament earnings with how successful he is, that he goes on to, to be one of the most uh, profitable poker tournament players Absolutely. in the world. Yeah, certainly. He certainly got the skill set for it. He, he just crushes every tournament he enters. He's not one to shy away from the big buy-ins either, which really helps, will help out his uh, you know lifetime earnings. It's pretty tough yeah. to to really climb that list unless you're playing some of the you know 100k, 1 million dollar buy-ins. I mean, looking at the all-time money list, uh, Daniel Negreanu was first with about 36 million. You know, Joe's you know a little less than half of that, but he, he could definitely get there. Yeah, he's got he's got a lot of years to catch up to where Daniel's at in life. Yeah. So. He stays on anything like his current pace. We could see him do it. Well, the problem is the more three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand buy-ins that exist, you know, people will just keep climbing the the, the list faster. So Joe's got to get in there and do well in those events too. So yeah, he doesn't travel outside of the states much, which may uh, no, he hinder him a bit. Yeah. But. Joe does, though, strike me as somebody who will always be playing poker, regardless of how much success or money he's had from it. It just, it, it, I, I feel like Joe loves the game of poker. Love is an interesting word, <laughs> um, but uh, I think he will always be playing the game. I, I, Joe won the main event and then was, you know, here at the Borgata not very long after playing some, you know, three hundred dollar buy-ins and and stuff like that. You know, just just doing his thing. That, that that's what he does. He's 
right now he plays poker. That's that's his that's what he does, and he's just gonna keep doing that. So you see the blinds have gone up to sixty thousand one hundred and twenty thousand with a twenty thousand ante. So some of those shorter stacks getting a little shorter. And kind of interesting to see Eric just call here. Well, we have Zach with a very, very speculative open under the gun here. Uh, Joe flatting, King Queen, and then Eric kind of weighing his options and opting to just call with Ace Queen offsuit, maybe because of ICM. I'm not sure. He's only got about 2.5 million. Yeah, you got Ace Queen. There's a lot of money here. in there. I'd probably just shove personally. Especially after everyone just saw us make this play with, you know, 6-3 off. It's a little different. His shove range is definitely going to be stronger than his range for doing what he did with the 6-3 off. But even so, he's, he's going to be perceived as a little bit lighter. So it does seem like a pretty good spot for him to shove free. He's still in the lead here, but it's going to be kind of hard for him to reach the river if anyone decides to put pressure on him. And I think Joe's going to start pouncing. Nope. Nope. Still don't. Again, a little surprised to see Joe check without, with, with the you know two overs in the gutter there. Yeah, we're seeing Joe catch bluffs a lot more than we're seeing him bluff. Yeah. Wow, and Eric is going to take it down with Ace Queen High here. Eric is going to take it I down. Felt like the pod. If anyone breathed on it, they were going to take it down. I got to say, I do like seeing Zach show some restraint on these boards that really just miss him completely. Because I think one of the things you see very often from a, someone who is the chip leader is, you know, they raise and they miss the flop and then they just start betting. And they're like, oh, I'm the big stack. I'm going to push these guys around. And you can't just always bet 100% of the time in every scenario. And and Zach is showing some of that restraint, which is which is definitely good to see. Well, so well, far Part of the key I playing the big stack is just knowing, like, when where the pressure points are where you can pressure your opponent's ranges because like sometimes if your opponent's even continue with the hand against you at all they're automatically going to be stronger than average you know because of the icm situation so it's important to know like at what point in each hand you have to start slowing down and respecting the fact that your opponent is choosing to stay in the hand with you so far i've been pretty confused by zach's pre-flop play he opened the eight deuce offsuit on the button he limped the button with the jack six offsuit and then he opened under the gun with with six three suited um, yeah, it's a little. It's been a little all over the place so far, but that's kind of, you know, Zach's game. I remember, you know, back in September of 2016, uh, it was kind of the similar thing. He gets, a, he does a little bit of everything. You kind of don't know what to expect from him, and I think that's part of what makes him such a tough player to play against. You know, he's doing one thing, and then a hand later, he just switches it up, kind of out of nowhere. And I don't know if there's things he's looking for that make him switch these plays up, or if he just does it to be random. But it, it's tough to play against, you know. It's really hard to pin someone down when you don't know what they're going to raise, what they're going to limp, what they're going to better check in any spot. You got to keep them guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Some upcoming WPT events, or any any of you boys traveling for anything? We've got, uh, we I know uh, we've got WPT Falls View, Falls View Poker Classic, uh, February 10th, up in Niagara Falls, and then LAPC after that, the LA Poker Classic, of course. Will you be attending? I missed that one. I will not be there. Will you be there, Mike? I'll be at the LAPC. Uh, That's a good one. Probably not going to Falls View, but. LAPC is a, a great event out of the commerce and uh, 25th anniversary this year. So I haven't been there in a few years. I think it's uh, time for me to make my trek across the U.S. I was yeah, I'm jealous. Right That's here. a good one. I've, I made day four of that one twice back when I lived in the States. And uh, 10K in L.A., it's very, very nice. A lot of people there. My, my good friend uh, Daniel Strelitz won it last year. So I've got to try to somehow upend him in this event and, you know, do one better. Maybe win it faster or more commanding than he did. Well, it'll probably be a larger yeah, field. A bigger it's field, 25th maybe. anniversary. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe I can knock him Hopefully out of the event field. this year. Maybe that'll be what I can do. There you go. Eric We're raising the Eric raising, off. I guess, the button. And now, is Joe considering a three-bet here? 
I think he's just thinking about defending. Uh, it's a very weak hand, but I think he might think that he can play a well, well enough post flop against Eric to just call. No, he is three betting. Oh, looks like he has three betting chips, and this is what we were discussing earlier, taking the hands that you would fold out of the big blind and three betting with them. That's what Joe is doing here. Yep, your, your read was better than mine there. Now, my only question is, why does it need to be the 8-3 off? I mean, would Joe have defended 8-4 off um, in the big blind? Would he have defended 9-5 off? I'm not sure where the exact cutoff point is for Joe, but the other thing you have to consider is, like, you're not going to get this spot that many times at the final table. Like, I mean, you know, Eric, Eric opening the button into your big blind, you're not going to get this spot all that many times, so it makes sense to kind of go hard on it and just kind of abuse it while it's, while it's there for you. Wow. By the time Eric managed to us to start like playing further against Joe in these type of spots, you know, it, the spot just might not come up again. Kind of surprised. Very nice play there, Joe. By Joe. Yeah, I think it's a nice play. You know, but you know, we, we just mentioned how he's avoiding a lot of these scenarios, folding the Jack Nine suited, folding the Nine Eight suited. And is, it, he, is that is this a big part of, of your guys' game? Just taking the bottom of your big blind range and, and turning it into three better, or I guess the top of the range you otherwise would fold. I think it's something that I don't you, do it as much as I should. Do. Yeah. Because I've now seen Joe do this in uh, consecutive final tables I've commentated. Uh, unfortunately uh, for me, uh, his opponent has folded every time. <laughs> uh, I'm curious uh, what Joe, how Joe is going to navigate certain flops out of position with yeah. a hand that basically flops zero equity. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Well, I think the key is he's picking spots where his opponent is sort of in jam or fold situations. Like with Eric's stack there, it's not that easy for him to call that much. Okay. So Joe's actual cards don't matter so much there. Yeah, I don't think it's something you see out of Joe deeper. <laughs> deeper stacked. Yeah, again, the common theme we're seeing with Joe is that he is he is getting out of line whenever his opponent has the widest, weakest range, like against a button open, for example. You know, he's not he's not pouncing on these squeeze spots against like an under the gun open and an under the gun one flat. He's waiting until somebody opens the button and then he's going. Well, Zach has a pretty wide range opening the cutoff, and we saw Joe not even consider a flat or a three bet with the eight nine suited as well. That's true. I was a little bit surprised to see him pass that one. We might see if he uh, you know gets a little more aggressive against Zach as the table goes on. Yeah, he may be just be waiting. He he may just see Eric as you know kind of a little easier to play against because of his stack size. Doesn't want to play a big pop or Zach. I can see that. He certainly seems to have Eric's number after that call with the Jack-10. That was pretty sweet. Now, is that something that uh, you guys, when you're at the final table here, if you were, Joe, that you would be thinking, that you want to kind of try to stay away from from Zach, from the big stack? I don't know. I think it can work both ways. I mean, Zach, as the chip leader, definitely doesn't want to play a big pop versus Joe. So you got to kind of read your chip leader and, and see if he's the type – there are some people that when they have a lot of chips actually really fold to a lot of pressure. Um, so if, if I can get that kind of feeling from an opponent, then I'm going to go after them. I'm going to do the op I'm just going to try to play as many pots as I can with them. But if it's someone who's just recklessly going to put chips in and apply pressure back to me, then yeah, you don't have a choice but to you know but to sit back. We mentioned uh, the final table where uh, you know Fareed Jatton came in as a chip leader. He was definitely not going to fold to aggression. You know, so I was you can't go after a guy like him. Uh, but if you know, who knows what Zach's going to do? He has he has not faced a lot of aggression yet. Three players going to this flop. Michael Martyr with a flush draw. Eric, top pair of queens. About thirty percent. Pop bet here. Back over to Mike Martyr. He has the flush draw. Is he going to raise or just call here? He calls. Off of his stack, I think it's going to be a little tougher to raise without committing yourself. The eight of hearts on the turn. Now this is a uh, this is a turn card where uh, a lot of Pio guys may choose to lead this hand. Yeah, it's definitely a spot where you can have a turn lead range. It does slow Eric down. Eric, that's 275,000. Very small, small Eric. Very small indeed. Might be tempting to call now that he's paired his due, so it wouldn't surprise me. But usually these small bets are kind of like begging for value, and that is exactly what Eric is doing here. This is the same bet that you know, Eric turned that low pair into a bluff against Joe. Well, Mike did the same. 
Mike using a time extension to think his decision over. He does make the call. Mike makes a call and gets the bad news. A nice little bit of extra value there from Eric. And we talked about Mike's jersey. Uh, we have it. I, I believe that Eric is, is probably the best dressed player at this final table. Mike, can you remember the last time you've seen somebody sporting an ascot at the final I table cannot. of a WPT? No, it's been a while. You probably see it more in Europe. Well, Eric is from Montreal. They're pretty fashionable people over that way. I've managed to travel there a couple times to play at the playground. Yeah, WPT has uh, several events there. I've heard good things about that venue. I haven't been there myself yet. Everyone does say it's one of the nicer venues. I I'm, I'm have not been there yet either. I hopefully will go at some point. I think this uh, th this year probably. Well, Eric's most recent final table was actually at the Playground Poker Club. Recently took a fifth place in a tournament there for 95,000 Canadian dollars. Eric has just under $2 million of, of live tournament earnings. He has the second most tournament earnings of any player who is at this final table. Second, obviously, to Joe McKeon. Yeah, hard to pass Joe on that front. Again, interesting to see from the only person, the only player at this final table who does not consider himself professional, that he's the sec has the second highest earnings of anyone here. Yeah, sometimes playing for fun can be an advantage if you don't have to worry about the money so much. You know, if you're if you're financially well off and you can afford to just play for the glory and try to make big final tables. Absolutely. He's sort of fearless, and we've seen a lot of that out of Eric here. He definitely is playing as though he wants to win, and he doesn't really care about the pay jumps so much, and that can be a bit of an advantage. Eric is another player at this table where over half of his live tournament earnings has come from one big score. He took first in a Hard Rock event in 2014 for about 1.1 million, uh, 1.08 million. Uh, is that's his WPT victory, I believe. That is his WPT yeah. title, yeah. Whereas uh, Zach and Justin, uh, for example, have uh, don't have this one big score that kind of stands out in their in their tournament career. That had a really good World Series uh, a couple of years ago, right? I believe it was last year, wasn't it? He final tabled the Monster Stack and final tabled something else. Zach did? Yes, he did. Yeah, he def definitely has had uh, no no shortage of success playing live in the U.S. I'll, I'll get his hand in mob up and fact check myself on this one. But I believe Joe final tabled the monster stack as well. Joe got yeah, second. He did, he did yeah, well. might have actually both tabled that tournament also. So all of a sudden we got Eric three betting here with the three four offsuit. We've seen him uh, splash around with these type of hands. He flops bottom pair here against Michael. Michael gets a bad flop for his ace ten suited. Uh, yeah, it looks like that was uh, 2014, Zach's big summer. Three final tables, a third, a fourth, and an eighth at the World Series. Okay, so Eric three bets the 3-4 off here. He gets bottom pair, and he opts to C bet. Uh, I probably would have checked this flop. We've seen Eric bet a few times with bottom pair. It just seems like he's kind of going to be the type of player that if he's going to continue, he's going to bet. Uh, as the preflop aggressor, I'd, I'd imagine that's what we're going to see a lot of out of him. If he deems his hand There's good enough. There's some degree to needing to protect your hand there as well because, I mean, even if you are ahead with bottom pair, you're not going to be ahead after a turn in a river. You'll and what do we think about Michael's flat there preflop instead of uh, as opposed to coming back over the top and going all in? It's kind of tough. It's kind of a, a bit of an awkward spot there. You know, Mike with, I believe he's got about 25 big blinds. You definitely can shove a hand like that, but I don't know. You know, you don't want to bust. You want to have some good flats in your range as well, right? And the hands like ace-10 suited are going to play a lot better as flats. Or if you have a hand like sevens or eights, that hand plays a lot better as a shove. Or even like ace-jack, ace-queen offsuit. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I would have flatted there as well. I'm just curious, after having seen Eric... 3-bet the 6-3 off. Now we've seen him 3-bet 
the three four off if, if those hands uh, need to start players need to start adjusting and turn those into shoves rather than flats moving forward. Yeah, against someone who's three betting that much, you can profitably shove with a lot. You may see more, some more adjustments on that front. There's also a bit of a leveling war, you know, because Eric is aware that people have seen him do that. So you have to wonder if he's sort of switching gears and being tighter next time. It turns out he wasn't, but, you know, it's, it's never super clear. Well, another notable hand when making that decision is the fact that Eric just flatted the ace-queen when he could have shoved all in in the squeeze opportunity. Yeah, that definitely changes his range. That's true. A bit. Some chat in the YouTube chat here about, you know, what do those lifetime earnings that you find, you know, on Hendon Mob and other internet sites actually mean? Uh, you know, a lot of players, a lot of people are under the impression that, you know, Joe has $14 million in, er in earnings means, oh, he's profited $14 million from poker. And that's not necessarily the case, not by a long shot, because those earnings do not subtract the buy-ins of the tournaments. Um, you know, if someone yep. cashes for... $14 million, there are definitely players that spend $13.8 million um, playing in those tournaments. I'm not saying that, that was, that's what Joe spent, but um, <laughs> it, you do have to take those earnings with a grain of salt. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I get that question a lot myself because I have the. I was the second person to hit a 10 million career earnings online. A lot of people think that means profit. Sadly, it does not. I wish it did. But in Joe's case, a surprisingly high amount of it is profit. Yeah, Joe has probably one of the higher ratios. I would imagine most main event winners do. Well, the way to estimate that is if you can get a good idea of, of a player's ROI, then you can estimate what percentage of it is profit. I imagine that online, Brian, um, that would be a lower number than it is than it is live. Uh, good live, very, very talented live players uh, who are playing, um, you know, large fields, uh, large soft fields. You can estimate, uh, I don't know, what do you think, Mike? Uh, you could have 100% ROI if you're an extremely talented player. I think it depends on the player and the event, but... Somebody like Joe McKeon, for example? Yeah, it's probably not. I, yeah, I think that's achievable. Possibly. Uh, online, is, like, online is tougher. The structures are worse. Um, so it's definitely a lot harder to get that sort of ROI online. But live, like really good structures, pretty soft fields. You know, you have the extra element of live play, so you can like view your opponent, get a better read on them. But definitely higher ROIs are achievable live. Coming up on March 3rd, the Saturday series is back here at the Borgata. I'll uh, be here for the $100,000 guarantee Saturday Series Deep Stack No Limit Hold'em, March 3rd at 11 a.m. with a $400 buy-in. The previous winner, Abraham Araya, took over, home over $23,000 during the Winter Poker Open. Will you be next? You ever played in those Saturday Series events, Kane? Can't say that I have. Kane, they're I good events, one-day events. Come here Saturday morning, $100,000 guarantee, and, and, and you can take home a, a lot of money. I finished second in one a while ago. It was a lot of fun, though. How much did that get you? Uh, I believe it was like 24000 or so. Yeah. It, was, it was a bit of a larger one. It was during one of these series a couple years back. Joe thinking about opening the cutoff here with a uh, fairly marginal holding, but he does have he, he does have the chip leader already having folded in front of him as an advantage. So he's raising into all shorter stacks. Yeah, Justin and, and Michael have both been relatively tight. But now Justin on the button with a real hand. Will at Justin with a three bet here. With quite a strong holding. And Joe will make the fold. He's not actually lying. That that might be the first bad open he's made all day. <laughs> Joe tends to, if you've ever played with Joe, he tends to talk a lot during hands, in between hands. He talks to people. He talks about hands. He just tends to speak a lot. I don't think he's lying too often, though. I think he really is trying to get in there and figure out what people have and see how they thought about hands and what they thought of his bets, what they thought of his play. Just 
I think it helps him get reads on people, honestly. Yeah, you, I mean, you see a lot, a lot of like really successful live players actually seem to have that tendency. Like Vanessa Selps is another one who does that. Mm -hmm. It's like constantly talking strategy with opponents in between hands, trying to figure out like what their thought processes are, that sort of thing. Michael going to go in for the limp again with the King-10 offsuit here. So he's on the button, right? Yeah. Definitely an uh, epidemic of limping at this final table. The spot where Zach could apply a decent amount of pressure just by raising to like 4x or 5x here out of the big blind. But with Queen-9, it's a good enough hand that you don't want to open yourself up to getting limpery raised. You'd probably rather choose some of the worst hands to raise with here. Makes sense. Other than your good hands, obviously. Looks like Eric with the worst of it is going to be leading here. He's pretty much dead. He does have a gutter, backdoor flush draw. He might think if you know his opponents had lots of aces or kings or queens in their hand, they would probably raise preflop. So not the worst read, but unfortunately for him, I don't think he's going to get two folds here. He's going to get through Zach a lot, but I do think that Michael's limping range contains a decent amount of these, uh, you know, Broadway type hands. So unless Michael open limp with like a pseudo connector or a pocket pair, he's not folding this bet that very often. But the way Eric's been playing, he may still wind up bluffing him off the hand, even though he's basically drawing dead other than the chop. Well, There's the chop. He won't be bluffing him off the hand on that turn. No, I don't think anyone's going to be bluffing now. You see 0% next to both players' names. That means it will be a chopped pot unless one of these players manages to fold by the river. Yeah, it seems difficult, but stranger things have happened, I guess. Yeah, we're just going to get it on the turn. Both players Mike chop. The Eric is going to... Or Michael is going to see the uh, bad news that he was basically a lock to win the hand got chopped on. Eric shows ten of hearts, six of diamonds. Both players have Broadway. Let's see the river. The nine of diamonds will chop the pot. Would have been a little more interesting if Mike just made the flat there, seeing that the flush completed on the river, perhaps. You know, if something crazy happened, one of these players would have gotten away from it. I think the stacks were too shallow, but with the deeper stacks, so. that I could have so potentially too. been a very interesting spot. Yeah. Brian, what's the uh, weather like out in Holland right now? Ray, uh, gray and rainy. Kind of like uh, Atlantic City, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I th was it snowing the earlier winters here rough. Did you drive here today, Kane? I or? don't think it was snowing. Uh, at least I didn't hit any snow. I looked out my window, and I, I could have swore it was, like, flooring a bit. Might have just been rain. What uh, Do you know in Fahrenheit how many degrees it is out there? Not like 40, maybe. Okay. About the yeah, same it bounces between, high. like, 30 yeah, and 40 most out. days. It's, it's just gray. You know, it's not that the weather's terrible or anything. It's not like we're dealing with constant snowstorms and blizzards, but it's, it's just kind of gray, and it gets kind of monotonous after a while. And will the people out in Holland be watching the big game on Sunday? Some of them. I, I, there's a, a lot of expats who live in uh, Amsterdam here, so I definitely have a few friends who are going to go to a bar and watch it. I'm probably just going to be playing online because the uh, anniversary Sunday million and a bunch of other stuff is going to be going on. But Cool. I'll watch it from home. I spent a little bit of time out there in uh, Alkmaar. Do you know that tiny little town called Alkmaar? It's, I guess, 25 minutes from Amsterdam. Yeah, I haven't been there, but I've heard of it. A lot of the little towns around here are pretty nice as well. Nice country overall, and you guys can check it out if you want to come to the WPT in Amsterdam. That's going to be, I believe, in May, or it might be April. It's usually in May, but it might be April this year. We're going to have a deep stack event and a World Poker Tour main event. So Ooh. if you guys are anywhere near Europe at that time, make sure you check that out. So speaking of the limping ep uh, epidemic at this table, we got Michael limping, Eric limping, over to Zach in the small blinds. 
I think this is a, like a microcosm of the way poker works. People see players do something and they want to try it. They s maybe assume it's good and they want to be like the other good players. I wonder how many guys like really came into today like saying, hey, I'm going to limp a lot versus, oh, that's a good idea. Let me try that. Well, so far we've yeah, seen... that's an interesting point. We've seen every player at this table open limp except for Joe and Justin. Yeah, Justin just hasn't played an incredible amount of pots so far. I would guess Joe's not going to limp unless it's blind versus blind or heads up. Yeah, I agreed. I'd, I think I'd Joe has a pretty to, good I'd, idea of what he's doing. I'd be willing to bet that Justin is not going to limp either. Hold on a second, guys. Uh, this is a quite the hand here. Wow. Mike has flopped <laughs> the set of threes. Eric is top pair, but Joe has flopped the nut straight. There's going to be, be a big action. one here. This could be the biggest pot of the tournament so far. Well, Joe raises it up to 950, and now Michael, there's no way that he's going to be able to get away from his yeah, set there's here. He goes he all in. Here. Joe calls. Mike gets the bad news, but he, he does have 35% equity here. Mike will need the board to pair. Otherwise, he will be our fifth place finisher. Turn card, please. Turn, Turn card's please. a queen, no help for Mike. He's going to need a queen, a four, a three, or a deuce the going to the river. Yeah! The river card is a queen, a queen, and Mike hits a full house. Well, that jersey working out so far. Mike <laughs> makes a full Joe house and wishing he'd more than double up. A yeah, nice hand for Mike there. A very uh, important, necessary double up for Michael Martyr there. And unfortunate for Joe McKeon, who's just kind of steadily been chipping up at this final table, playing very, very well, and then you just get it all in, uh, just about a two to one favorite, and uh, things don't go your way. Yeah, I don't think we've seen Joe make a single mistake so far. He hasn't put a chip in, you know, behind without the right equity. He hasn't, I mean, everything he's done has just been perfect, but sometimes, you know, sometimes he just gets screwed. <laughs> yeah, he pretty much lost most of what he's made today. Back to about what he started the day with. Well, knowing Joe, he'll still manage to uh, make a run out of it. He's still in second place, um, and he's still in fine shape. Mike, with that more than double up, moving to fourth. Just over five million now. That uh, no player at this final table enjoyed that river other than than Michael. Uh, the other players uh, sweating to move up in the in the pay scale here.